Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kemp. Uh, they are maybe uh, at the wedding also. I saw the wedding outside. Maybe they are at the wedding, the person that they are not back. So uh, I will try to not be too long about this talk. Uh, this is my disclosure uh, slide. And um, I will just start by saying that we will uh, definitely, uh, in my mind, I think uh, anticoagulate more. And uh, I think y you can appreciate that. And by the talk that we had this morning, the, the population is becoming older. Uh, so this is a clear indication for to anticoagulate. Uh, it is clearly supported by guidelines, uh, especially if we consider the CHADS VASC score. It's easier to f to to uh, to have points and to put patient under anticoagulant. Uh, it's it's true also that we are going to anticoagulate more if we consider that CHADS or CHADS VAS score of, of one is is the, the threshold for anticoagulation, and also because we have newer anticoagulants that they are at least as effective as Coumadin, and at least as as, uh, as uh, safe and then Coumadin and even aspirin if we consider a in in a in a trial. But there's certain things that they are assured, and we saw that this morning. Some we still uh, experience some stroke, and we see some stroke despite anticoagulation. Despite anticoagulation, this is especially true for Coumadin, and this this is true also to say that the, with the newer anticoagulant, we will still face major bleeding. So, I think there's a clear role for this procedure of left atrial appendage uh, occlusion in the context of a, of, a, of a safe procedure, I will say. If we can do this procedure uh, without too much complication, there's no, no risk procedure. But if we can do that on this, uh, very safely, I think it's it wise to, to, to say that we, there's a place in, in, in the field uh, for that. So to do a safe procedure, first of all, I think we should select the appropriate patient. And we spent some time also this morning on this topic. But uh, we should probably say that the appropriate patient is a patient with a score of, uh, or score, uh, a CHADS or CHADS VAS score of at least two, uh, potentially one, but certainly two, and a high risk of bleeding based on different uh, things, either major bleeding under anticoagulant or other significant comorbidities that we explained this morning. Concerning the CHADS or the CHADS FAD score, we should, uh, I think, say up front that it's not something that we will use in patients with significant valvular heart disease or congenital heart disease. It's not uncommon to have atrial fibrillation related to atrial septal defect. We should not, I think, apply CHADS VAS score in a patient like this. So I think we should not base uh, the selection of a patient uh, for anticoagulant, uh, and we should not apply the score to all the patient with atrial fibrillation, and we should consider uh, these patients uh, with non-valvular um, atrial fibrillation, and, and uh, which, uh, sorry, with valvular or congenital related atrial fibrillation for procedure like we are doing, uh, left atrial appendage occlusion. Concerning the level of um, the, the cutoff for patient at high risk for bleeding, we should probably consider an ASBET score of three. I think ASBET score of three and more, they are certainly, uh, we should certainly have a low threshold to consider uh, the procedure. And I think it's, it's going to be safer we, if we select these kind of patient because they are typically also at very high risk for, for bleeding under anticoagulant. If we want to perform a safe procedure, I think we should uh, exclude left atrial appendage uh, thrombus. We should screen the patient with uh, transesophageal echo. I'll know, uh, and I know very well that there's few case report, uh, not report, but done so far uh, with uh, thrombus in the appendage. Uh, this is feasible. I think I suspect that it's going to be reported in literature very soon. But I, I, for now, we should probably ex uh, exclude patient with left atrial uh, 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 thrombus uh, with uh, thrombus in the left atrial appendage because it, it just increases the risk of that procedure. If you want to do a, a safe procedure, we we'll also need to define very well the anatomy before a procedure. We can do that with the transesophageal echo, but we can also consider fancy thing like CT scan or MRI. I think it, there's a lot of variation. We saw that also this morning between the patients, so I think it's always helpful uh, before a procedure to do some imaging to at least uh, select prop maybe the, the, uh, proper, the proper device and uh, the proper technique to close that appendage. 
At the TE, before the procedure, we will do a different view, not only to define well the ostium, but also to, s to define the landing zone and the length of that, that appendage, the number of lobes also. We can consider 3D echo if it's available. And it's not uncommon that we see that the ostium is oval shape and it's, uh, it's, 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 good, it's a good thing to appreciate before the procedure. In the CAT lab, we'll do a different view. I think we should maximize the visualization of that, this, uh, this structure. Uh, we should at least do a RAO cranial view to see at least the proximal part of that appendage. But the also the distal part can be probably better seen with the RAO caudal view. So I think we should do few uh, views. Uh, if it's possible, sometimes it's limited by the uh, by the renal function, at least to maximize what, the, what we can appreciate from this structure. I think CT scans are also helpful to try to define the anatomy. Uh, we can uh, see very well here the anatomy of the appendage, but also re the, the, the relationship with the other structure, like the pulmonary vein, the mitral valve. Uh, this is sometimes often also limited by the renal function of the patient, typically old patient with uh, uh, significant comorbidities, but if it's possible, this is something that it's uh, helpful, at least at the beginning of, uh, of the experience with the left atrial appendage occlusion. I think we should control the environment uh, around this procedure. Uh, we should be in an ideal setup. Uh, ideal setup for, my, for, for, for myself is a general anesthesia and T guidance. Uh, I think it will at least limit the potential complication uh, related to transesophageal echo in a patient under sedation, for example. Uh, so to maximize the safety of this procedure, I think this is the ideal setup. We should uh, avoid vascular complication. And to avoid vascular complication, what I'm suggesting is we should not do an arterial puncture. Uh, I mean, often the anesthesis is putting a uh, radial line to monitor the blood pressure, but we should probably stay away from the uh, artery in the fa in the uh, in the groin, and uh, we can consider to do venous puncture under echo guidance to maximize the uh, safety uh, the safety in the groin. We should perform a good transeptal puncture uh, again to maximize the uh, chance to have a good uh, transeptal and a safe transeptal puncture. You can do a TE or a use intracardiac echo. Or if you are not using that for any reason, I will not. Uh, suggest to do the procedure, but if you're not using TE for any reason, you should maximize the, the chance to have a good transeptal puncture do, do, by doing a different uh, fluoroscopic view. Uh, so this is the TE uh, bicaval view, and in this view, we like to be lower in the septum, so towards the inferior vena cava to reach uh, the left atrial appendage, typically uh, more, uh, in more in good position to close eventually. This is the short axis view. Uh, in this view, we uh, like to do a posterior puncture, uh, again, to access well the uh, left atrial appendage. If you are not using echo, uh, there's different landmarks that we can use to do a, a good transeptal puncture that you should maximize, I think. We really want to do, uh, a, a, to do a safe procedure. We really want to try to avoid hair, and there's different tips and tricks uh, related to that. We, uh, we should remove a guide wire and sheet uh, using different techniques like uh, using a syringe filled with water or we can remove the things under water. We should be also very careful when we introduce a device inside. We can do under flush. There's different techniques. We should uh, use, use all the tips and tricks that are available. We should pay special attention in patients that they are breathing spontaneously. We don't want to have an... They don't want to, uh, they don't, we don't want them to aspirate hair when they breathe. We also want to avoid perforation for a safe procedure. Uh, we always want to exchange uh, the, the catheter under, on, on a stiff wire placed in a, in a good position. Often it's the left upper pulmonary vein, sometimes it's in the left atrium using an Inui wire, for example, a wire that we are using for mitral valvuloplasty. We don't want to push delivery sheet and dilator far in the left atrial appendage. It's a very thin uh, structure. The, the, the wall is very thin, so uh, we don't want to push a large sheet without any protection in the left atrial appendage. So this is a very supportive wire. This is an Inui wire placed in the left atrium. Sometimes it's difficult to push the sheet in the groin, 
or, or across the atrial, the atrial septum. So you, we need to use like stiff wire like this one to cross the, uh, the, the, the septum. We can also use a stiff wire placed in the left upper pulmonary vein, and this is a very safe way to, to reach a left atrium. This is a pigtail put in front of a large sheet, and we will follow with the large sheet over the pigtail, and this is also very safe uh, to do, uh, to minimize the, uh, the risk of perforation with that large sheet in the left atrial appendage. Also, to perform a safe procedure, we want, of course, to avoid thrombus, and uh, we will uh, give uh, aparin during the procedure, um, uh, typically after the transeptal puncture, but I know that some operator, they like to give aparin right away at the beginning of the procedure, even before transeptal puncture, and I guess it, it depends on the level of confidence that you have in your transeptal uh, technique. So uh, if you're, you're very good with the transeptal, I think it's very... Uh, very fair to give the aparin uh, at the beginning of the procedure to be sure that we are not going to avoid to uh, to uh, to uh, to forget that. And uh, to have a safe procedure, I will also suggest that you need to follow carefully your patient. And uh, there's diff there's a relevant thing that you should uh, th that you should find. I think a patient with peripheral effusion should be uh, should be uh, diagnosed before discharge. So I, I will suggest that you do, you need to do at least a transthoracic echo before discharge because if you detect a pregural infusion, you will potentially uh, avoid the tamponade uh, because you will treat or at least follow that more carefully. You should probably de detect thrombus on the device um, by doing a test, uh, potentially a transesophageal echo. I'm not sure when. Uh, in our center, we are doing transcendental echo three months after the procedure. We are probably missing some thrombus before, uh, but at least we should at least. I will argue that we do. We 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 need to do one at the follow up to detect a potential thrombus that we can potentially treat. I'm not sure that it's changing something, but at least you will do something uh, if you see a thrombus. So this is a pericular effusion that was detect detected before discharge. It should be found and should be treated uh, in my mind. Uh, this is a thrombus that was found three months after cardiac plug, and this is another thrombus that was found also three months after Watchman. Uh, in both cases, uh, it was treated with, uh, with anticoagulation, at least for a few weeks. Uh, with a good evolution uh, of the patient. If it's not found, it's not going to be treated. Is it going to change something? I'm not sure, but at least, at least I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that we are changing something for this patient. A residual leak, it's, uh, it's not clear if it's changing something to find them. Uh, so if we are doing a, con a control TE, it's not to find residual leak uh, so far, except potentially with the watchman, if we have a large leak, we can argue that we should not continue the anti anticoagulation, but we are not sure what to do so far with these, uh, with these leak. Same thing is possible with uh, after a cardiac plug here, a residual small leak around the device. So I will conclude by saying that there's a clear role uh, for an intervention that can potentially prevent recurrent stroke uh, despite anticoagulation, that, that can prevent bleeding episode under anticoagulant. However, safety should be maximized uh, by a good patient selection, by a good uh, setup around this procedure, and with the respect of few important technical aspects related to that procedure. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Ibrahim. I think we'll take all the questions later as before. <laughs>